Welcome, everyone. I am here today uh, with Debbie Drell, who is the Director of Membership at Nord. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Porath, the founder and CEO of The Mighty. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with Debbie for the last uh, several years. I'm actually on the Board of Directors for Nord, which is the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Um, I think of it as an umbrella organization that's helping support hundreds of uh, nonprofits in the rare disease space from a, in so many different perspectives, um, policy and otherwise. Um, uh, Debbie, tell us a little bit more about uh, Nord from your point of view. You, you know, live and breathe it every day, and uh, and a little bit more about your role as well. Sure. So Nord is a national nonprofit organization, a 501c3, dedicated to improving the lives of rare disease patients. 25 million Americans living with rare diseases and their families. And I actually started working at Nord four years ago out of their DC office. And so but I have a sister who was diagnosed with a rare disease more than 22 years ago. And I knew about Nord before I worked at Nord. And the organization, before I started working there, I just had this impression that this was the mothership, the organization that brings all the rare diseases together. And uh, I worked at the Pulmonary Hypertension Association for 13 years in honor of my sister. and working at Nord is like a dream come true because Nord works with 330 nonprofit member organizations. And my job is to help them with capacity, help them navigate FDA and NIH, help them with their mission. So Nord's mission is actually the mission of uh, the umbrella of all these nonprofit organizations. Nord is actually the reason why my sister is alive. And it's not hyperbole that I say that because um, in the early 90s, there were no nonprofits for pulmonary hypertension. And this is kind of the origin story of a lot of nonprofits. It's you get diagnosed, you, go, you try to find other patients. And in the 90s, there was no internet, which is like, what? Uh, they had to write letters to each other, but they first the first patient contacted Nord and Nord connected them with other patients and they formed the nonprofit and Nord was integral to that nonprofit. Once that nonprofit was formed, they started pushing for drug development and research and brought patients together at conferences where researchers came in and drew blood. That led to the first treatment. And now there's 16 treatments. The first treatment saved my sister's life in 1998. And with a rare disease like pulmonary hypertension, 50% of people diagnosed die within the first two years if left untreated. And if there's no treatments, the mortality rate is that high. And so in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of pulmonary hypertension being diagnosed in autopsy. And when the first drug stopped working for my sister, there was another treatment. This is all part of Nord's mission is helping one patient at a time. So yeah. how is life for drug development um, is the key to that. Yeah, and I'll actually tell my, my origin story with, with Nord in terms of long before I started The Mighty, um, I, I got involved in the rare disease community because I have a daughter uh, with a rare disease, Duke 15Q syndrome. And um, I was part of an organization called Duke 15Q Alliance, which is the nonprofit that helps people with my daughter's condition. And um, I was representing our small nonprofit, which was really, um, you know, it was a small volunteer organization at that point that was uh, just parent run. And uh, I attended a NORD um, uh, summit and, and it blew me away in terms of how helpful Nord could be at, at, you know, our small little group. And we're trying to figure out how to professionalize, how to work with the pharma industry, how to, um, you know, bring on scientists that were, there will really be invested in researching, you know, my daughter's syndrome um, and the programs that Nord um, had put together and the, all the, you know, different advocates and the leaders of these organizations they brought together was so helpful, you know, I think to me and to our organization, Duke 15Q Alliance at the time, um, and just growing the organization and helping us, again, professionalize so we can be more effective, you know, advocates, um, you know, for, you know, for the people with the syndrome. So uh, that was, that was my first experience with Nord and it has, you know, since really blossomed and, and grown into something that's, um, you know, impacting so many more people now. Um, so our, our conversation was titled, uh, rare disease in the digital age. And I am curious from your perspective, you work with so many organizations in, in the space. Um, how have things changed, you know, since uh, March of last year when, you know, the pandemic hit and it, it altered our lives in so many ways? I'm just curious how you've seen, uh, what, what changes have you seen in the rare disease community because of that? 
That's a great question. Um, so one big change uh, that I've noticed, uh, and I learned about this actually, so in January of 2020, uh, the government declared a public health emergency. And I learned recently that telehealth visits before the pandemic accounted for less than one one hundredth of a percent, so 0.01% of total health care visits across the country. And by mid-April, that number had increased to 69%. So a massive leap. Like I never did a telehealth appointment until the pandemic, and I actually love it. Um, and there's good reason for telehealth to, we want telehealth to be here for good, regardless of the state of emergency or not. With a rare disease, it's always a state of emergency and we need to have telehealth available. So that was a huge change was mm -hmm. that patients were being able to access uh, their medical care in a very unique way. For nonprofit organizations, because that's my ballywick and that's the uh, network that I work with, uh, from our member organizations that they're gonna lose a lot of money. And many of our nonprofits are small organizations where their revenue for the year is 50,000 for the year. And that gala that was supposed to happen in June can't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. No one's meeting. Uh, there were also a lot of uh, hubbaloo internally, like, are we having a meeting in, in October or not? And so in March and April, many of our members were really struggling with hotel contracts for in-person events, not knowing what to do. And um, they also had to pivot to virtual. So Nord staff, like when we learned that we were going to go in a lockdown and we thought it was going to be temporary, we went uh, our IT staff went to Costco and loaded up on laptops because <laughs> <laughs> because our patient assistance staff, there's a, a bunch of dozens of staff who do work on patient assistance. They need to work from home on private laptops. So we, uh, everybody was sort of shuffling and scrambling to, to make it happen. And um, Nord responded by creating a program that gave out $200,000 worth of grants for our members to pivot to virtual. And then we did a webinar series. It was called Rapid Response. And we started it in May, how to deal with crisis communications, how to pivot to virtual fundraisers. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, our organizations were salient, not one closed down. Wow, I, I didn't actually realize that. Um, I certainly know the struggle so many organizations had, um, the nonprofit world really struggling with uh, uh, fewer donations, as as you said, could not have the events that typically bring in, you know, a lot of money. And I know that's affected a lot of organizations, but that's, it's fantastic that Nord has helped uh, those organizations not shut down and, and find ways to keep going. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I've noticed in the rare disease community is, you know, so much of the focus is on research. You know, you have these different organizations that are working with, um, you know, scientists, researchers, uh, pharma companies in some in some cases doing work to try to uh, better determine what are, treatments could be developed to help people with you know whole variety seven thousand different rare diseases that are out there and I'm curious from your point of view um, are there you know what ways have you seen technology help advance research in recent years um, so that not all of it has to be done in in clinical settings uh, which was obviously difficult to do during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I also actually want to pause and say thank you for having me. You asked about like my connection with Nord and I just went straight into it. Thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. I'm such a fan of yours and a fan of the mighty um, the entire time. And then also wanted to say to the people commenting, Lysandra, we love what you do and thank you for being here. Jeff, you're two miles from our office. Call us. Um, <laughs> we could always use a virtual volunteer slash you could come to the office socially distance with a mask maybe um and then fern uh who said she was homebound and bedbound uh, and that telehealth changed her life i really appreciate you sharing that um it's a game changer and actually telehealth has been the technology that's really helped with research and clinical trials the technology now, I mean, it's, it reminds me, you know, for the longest time, employers were saying, we can't do telecommuting. No one's going to work. They're going to hang out and watch soap operas all day or whatever, whatever the reason. You know, we don't have the technology to do that. And now we're forced to do that. Well, the pandemic has put us in a situation where we're forced to do whatever we can. And I'll never forget the beginning of the pandemic. Research sites were closing down and patients were getting desperate 
and nonprofit organizations were calling us to say, what are we supposed to do now? And then they pivoted and even FDA created uh, guidelines for clinical trials and research to help uh, with flexible protocols to enable decentralized trials and research. Now, you mentioned 7,000 rare diseases, 90% of rare diseases have zero FDA approved treatments. Mm -hmm. So research is vital. And if you close this, if you close down clinical trials, you're really cutting off hope and uh, we will lose people to their diseases. Uh, one fact that I learned recently was in a study done of the four years, even before the pandemic, clinical trials for rare diseases, one in four of them were terminated early because of low patient enrollment. And that is the barrier to going to a clinical trial site. You have a trial site, you have a country that's as big as the United States and your trial sites in Baylor or UCLA or uh, Children's Hospital. And if you live, if you don't live near those hospitals, you, you can't participate unless you have the privilege, the money, the time, the know-how and the ability to uproot your family and move your entire life to that trial site. And the trial is, probably the only place where there's treatments that can keep your child or yourself alive. So these are really hard decisions that patients have to make. Um, and that's a huge barrier. So even before the whole telehealth shift, Nord was scheming um, and created this incredibly innovative program called HOME. And it's a natural history of a disease called metachromatic leukodystrophy, which is a devastating disease. Um, but this natural history study mails everyone uh, an electronic tablet that's preloaded with surveys, all the apps that they need to connect with the clinical research study. It is completely 100% virtual. They have a smartphone app for patients to record their health care healthcare encounters. So basically, you never have to go walk into a hospital. You never have to travel and pack your bags and upend your life. And it's a year long study. So if you participate in a clinical trial, you're not doing a one time visit. You know, this is pre pandemic. So the technology is there that enables decentralized trials. So your own home, literally, it's called a home study. Your home is the site. Yeah. There is no yeah. brick and mortar. It's kind of amazing and revolutionary. Yeah. I mean, I, I know from working with our own uh, team of doctors with my daughter that um, there's been pros and cons to some of the telehealth. Some, I mean, some of the things that are just difficult is they would love to see my daughter in person, right? They still want to be able to interact with her and all that. But um, she often is set off by being in that setting. And they can actually see her much more in the natural environment she's at, you know, at home with the other kids running behind her doing, <laughs> doing whatever they're going to do. Um, and so they have seen a lot of benefits from that. And it gives them uh, just the, the challenges that so many people have to travel, you know, to places where they're actually going to see a specialist you know, for that rare disease, that could be a flight that could be, you know, a full day's drive. And those, you know, can, you know, have kind of gone away when it when it comes to some of those things. And I, I know that, again, from working with a number of rare disease organizations myself, I've, it seemed like at the beginning of the pandemic, what you kind of alluded to is some of those clinical trials were put on pause, right, which is scary in the sense of, we don't want to stop the, the you know, this, this process. But I think it forced some degree of like regulations changing uh, because of everything that happened that, that I hope that it now has acted as an accelerant to be able to do a lot more research virtually um, in different settings, because that was the only way it could be done, you know, for much of the last year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What you, what you shared about your family's experience with telehealth is, is really what we keep hearing again and again, like, please don't let us go back to the old way. And yeah. Nord, Nord is actually advocating because when that health emergency state expires, 30 states, um, maybe almost 30 states in the country are about to shift back where they're no longer flexible across state lines. Yeah. And that's yeah. going to be really problematic. One of the research projects that we did um, with, we collaborated, or the Mighty collaborated with um, UCLA and some others on was looking at the impact of children with a variety of rare disease, a lot of the um, developmental um, uh, diseases. And uh, what we saw in that study was that, you know, because so many of these kids lost services, the therapy, the therapists, the teachers, all of that, Zoom school didn't necessarily work for a lot of these kids, including my daughter, um, that there was a, a really, uh, that the kids were facing a lot more challenges. I'm curious with the work that you do with those hundreds of organizations, 
have they seen that have they seen that kind of turn have things gotten better um in 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 that way in terms of like the psychosocial impact of being isolated and being able to are are uh, more organizations are they seeing you know the people with the uh, with the various rare diseases actually be able to get those services back that they may have missed out on when the pandemic hit that I'm, I'm thinking of you know therapies and things like that because of telehealth whether telehealth or, or or being able to actually go back into more clinical settings now yeah I'm not sure actually I can't answer that. Um, that's not anything that I've heard directly from the organizations. Okay. Um, well, let's move on and talk a little bit about um, the uh, how we help uh, patients become uh, advocates. So, if if you know someone is diagnosed today, or in often cases, it's a uh, parents want to start an organization because they have a a child that was just diagnosed with something, and there's not an organization for them to join. It it could be a very rare disease, or it could be an adult that gets a diagnosis that uh, folks hadn't seen before and wants to start an organization, um, you're kind of the go-to person for figuring out how to help them. So tell me a little bit about that process when you get contacted by someone who wants to start an organization um, but doesn't really know how to. Sure, yeah. So nonprofit organizations, it, starting a nonprofit takes a lot of work. I would say come to Nord, we have this program called Rare Launch. And I talked about my sister's story in the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. Rare launch is something that we're recently starting to, to put out in the community, but we've been doing it from the beginning, which is bringing patients together and helping them start a nonprofit. And you have to get incorporated locally in your state and then get incorporated at the federal IRS treasury level. But it's really building a movement. What's your mission? What is your unmet need? Are there people on a Facebook group or in the community that you know of who might be interested in helping you? You have to form a board of directors. The benefit of starting a nonprofit is that with that 501c3 tax status, you can fundraise big donations. And it takes big donations to fund research. Of the 7,000 rare diseases, Nord works with 1,200 nonprofits. That means that there's almost 6,000 rare diseases that do not have a 501c3 or representation. Well, I encourage anyone who's interested in starting a nonprofit, if there's not one in your for your disease, um, please come talk to Nord so we can help you. We've actually conducted two uh, half-day webinars or workshops that help people navigate the process of forming a foundation from writing your mission to fundraising to identifying board of directors, really having that kitchen table meeting with founders and dreaming big. The <laughs> goal is treatments, a cure, support, education, awareness, and Nord has your back. We can help you from start to incorporation. Yeah, and I can <laughs> certainly speak to the, you know, the assistance that our own organization, Duke 15Q Alliance, was given uh, uh, just in that process of you know, uh, we were actually an organization, but we were really trying to learn the ropes of, you know, how to do all the things that we wanted to do, set up a genetic registry, you know, all the things that would help, you know, researchers in the future. So I can speak from authority that I know that uh, that works well and the, the work that you and your team do is is uh, so helpful to, to those other organizations. Um, uh, I'm curious, you know, again, in this time where everything became virtual, you have... Uh, you know, examples of rare disease organizations or advocates that have really effectively, you know, found ways to bring people together, whether those are, you know, families or families plus researchers or, you know, uh, but, you know, that, that's, that was a difficult thing that a lot of um, folks were trying to overcome. And I'm just curious, again, with your work with all those organizations, if you saw some examples um, that you could share uh, to help, you know, uh, viewers that may be watching this, um, you know, get, get some tips on ways that uh, things that they could potentially do with their own organizations. Yeah, sure. Well, Dupe Fifteen Q did an amazing, like, all-day Facebook event that yeah. I was enthralled by. Yeah. You had musicians and singers and talent, like, so much talent. Um, Vanessa Vogel Farley, who was the ED, what a vision she had. Yeah. I will say, I tell everybody about the work that Dupe Fifteen Q. Uh, did for their big awareness campaign. Um, Children's Tumor Foundation had an incredible event. Um, APBRDF, uh, I live in alphabet soup 
land. Uh, this, <laughs> <laughs> this group did this virtual um, Jewish uh, culinary event and um, it was just an incredible experience. People can create unbelievable experiences virtually. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking about these virtual fundraising gilas and events, but um, they're, they're all online. And I will say that Rare Disease Day is the best way to see it all. Like everybody's beating the drum on the last day of February. Yeah. And wow. next year is not gonna be an exception. We are really gonna be uh, promoting all uh, 25 million Americans, the hundreds of millions around the world are gonna be participating mm -hmm. in this event. Um, we had this campaign called um, Light Up for Rare. I think that's the name of it. Um, I should know this, but uh, yeah, Light Up. For, I keep wanting to say it's lit, lit up for rare, what the young people say. Um, it's lit. Uh, but uh, we lit up, the rare disease community lit up the Empire State Building, Big Ben in London, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, 550 organizations, um, or 550 monuments and landmarks were lit up around the world. So it's it's almost like a merger of things happening in person, but virtually. So you, you could see it all unfolding in real time. It, it felt like, you know how in, on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, you can see like, oh, Australia celebrating. Now India is celebrating. It was kind of like that, where it just sort of rolled out every hour, some new activity and campaign. That yeah. is a great way. Like sign up for Nord's Facebook. And of course, the Mighty participates as well. Um, because that's where we really get so many diverse activities and yeah. events that people can participate in virtually. Yeah, and I saw you know, organizations, including ones that I'm a part of, do some really simple things that were effective that the truth is we should have been doing them before the pandemic. Um, we started within Duke 15Q Alliance, um, we started just having happy hours where people could come on and they could have a, a beer, a glass of wine. And But what happened was you had a lot of new families, meaning... Uh, had gotten a recent diagnosis, right? And so we're still like not sure of the world that they were, you know, navigating. And then you had, you know, people that have known each other for years as parents, sometimes older parents of, of children um, who've been at this, who really just want to connect to see each other and, you know, talk to each other and um, just had some great discussions. It was so simple. Everyone just jump on a Zoom. Um, and and, and he, the, the younger families or the newer families being able just to pick up lots of things and ask questions to these other families that were really kind of becoming mentors, you know, to them. Um, those types of things that we used to wait on doing, you know, a family conference every two years, which we still do. And there's huge benefits to that. But there are a lot of benefits to just being able to use the technology now. And get together and be able to, you know, share experiences, give tips, give advice, answer questions. Um, and sometimes we bring on, you know, scientists and researchers who, again, know our community, know our kids really well. Um, and, uh, and it was so simple and, again, could have been done <laughs> before the pandemic, but no one was used to doing those things. And, uh, but I, I found that those simple ways of, of connection and just people sharing their experiences could be really valuable, particularly to some of the families that were, again, uh, more newly di diagnosed. Yeah, absolutely. Also, I want to go to your happy hour, but I will bring, I'll be bringing, <laughs> I'll be bringing kombucha to that one. But yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, when the pressure hit, we responded with hope. Yeah. We responded with love. We came closer together. I mean, I still miss hugs, but I will be on a Zoom to catch up with my family in Mexico any day. And yeah. actually yeah. that's true, like globally, we can connect now. The a Plastic Anemia and MDS Foundation told us uh, that when they pivoted to virtual, mm -hmm. they dropped their registration rate and all of their international partners participated so that they ended up, uh, and many of our groups do this, shifting their time to try to get maximum time zones. Yeah. So we're really becoming way more global and connecting uh, now that we're now that we're virtual. But for those who don't have uh, technology access, or technology literacy, you know, I, I always suggest consider having a telephone line and a telephone option and, you know, creating creating the opportunities for people to dial in even if they can't see. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's our um, So, you know, moving on to, I mean, we're talking about, you know, people getting together virtually. There's a big event that Nord is putting on soon, uh, the Nord Summit, um, which will be virtual this year. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, talk a little bit about the summit? What's involved there? Um, how people can participate? Uh, just give people a 
some lens into what the summit is and, and, and what they may get out of it if they choose to participate. Yeah, sure. The summit is our rare disease and orphan products breakthrough summit. That's the actual official name. It's very long, but it really is drug development research. It brings different stakeholders together, nonprofit leaders, patient advocates, and FDA, uh, industry, so pharmaceutical companies. Um, the workshops are going to look at everything under the sun related to research and these technologies. Um, we have the link in the chat uh, for people to take a look at nordsummit.org. Um, really want to encourage everybody to attend and learn more about that if this is something that you're interested in. Um, for the general community, let's say that you're not involved in drug development per se, um, Living Rare, Living Stronger is an event that we host in the summer that brings patients together to learn more how to live your best life, patients and caregivers. And so that's an event that uh, we also talk about that um, creates the bonds where you can meet people and share your story and your experiences. So Summit, if you're, if you're involved in drug development and research and uh, Rare Disease Day for everybody, and then Living Rare, Living Stronger um, for uh, patient and caregiver communities. These are some of our key events throughout the year. But wait, there's more. I will say uh, the Rare Action Network um, is a network that gets you plugged in at the state level. So if you don't wanna virtually travel to these events or conferences, let's say you can't wait from one conference to the next, you wanna connect with somebody right now with a rare disease who happens to live in your state. Uh, we have 17,000 individuals living with rare diseases across the country involved in the Rare Action Network. If you visit rareaction.org, you can link up to your state ambassador. They're doing awareness, education, connections. Um, so I would say there are so many ways to fight back and ways to connect with people and Nord really has a good community. So if your population is 10 people and you're 10, you, you don't know who they are and they're scattered around the world, connect with somebody who has a rare disease because we understand it. We get it, we get the stigma, we understand the challenges, the delay in diagnosis, the struggle for a cure, um, we're here for you. All right, am I back? I have a technical issue there. You're back. Um, well, uh, great. So I missed a, a small part of that, but I heard most of it. Um, so uh, as you, again, think about uh, where rare disease, you know, community is going, uh, just in terms of, uh, we talked, we've hit on some of the telehealth issues, the, uh, or options now that, that weren't before, um, talked about, you know, how people can leverage technology to get together in ways they hadn't before. You know, anything else that you'd want to discuss or mention in terms of what uh, maybe what Nord is doing, any initiatives that it may have, or um, areas of opportunity that you see that the rare disease can do, can, community can do more with? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. Um, so we talked about events and we talked about starting a nonprofit. Um, I will say that we have um, this new program relatively new program called the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator Data Analytics Platform. Mm -hmm. Say that 10 times fast. Um, but it's a, a data analytics platform where multiple stakeholders, researchers, FDA, NORD, uh, Critical Path Institute, and patient organizations develop this platform where registry data can all come together. And so I say this because there's a lot of silos in research. Uh, scientific research has historically been very competitive where researchers don't release their data until they're published. And so um, if these data are in silos, um, it slows down drug development. And so the platform actually enables and fosters collaboration. It fosters data sharing and you know, curing a rare disease is a mystery. And every registry is a set of clues for the mystery. And wouldn't you want all of the clues to be in one place and all the greatest thinkers to be able to access all of the clues? Essentially, that's what this data analytics platform is. It also has analytical tools that are innovative that allow people to look at the data um, consistently, uniformly, and it's regulatory ready. So it's, um, really innovative. I'm not sure if I really explained that well, but 
what I would say is if you are not involved in research, find your nonprofit organization and see if they're doing research. And if they are, now is a good time because a lot of things are virtual still to enroll in a natural history study and get that data into the Curious Accelerator platform because we need every piece of the 25 million Americans, all of the pieces of the puzzle uh, to be able to cure all of our rare diseases. Yes, and I want to call out what you said there around uh, of data uh, again with an example of what I've witnessed within the Duke 15 Q Alliance of how it can be so helpful to both scientists but also uh, family members as well. So one of the things that we did is set up a network of clinics around the country that um, that brought together specialists that actually had seen you know children with with Duke 15 Q syndrome before and they brought together groups of people, they know the types of issues, whether it's seizures or GI related or um, you know, anxiety and you know autism related behaviors. And so they knew the right types of people to bring together and they began, um, each of these people started seeing more children with this disorder. So they became more educated. It was great for families because um, almost just about anyone in the US can now drive to a place uh, like that, that they don't have to get on an airplane for it. So it's a lot easier to access specialists but it's also working as a almost like a data collection hub uh, or hubs around the country where we can now, because we're actually bringing uh, more people in to see the specialists they need to see, we're collecting data that we never had before. Um, and all of those scientists are now talking with each other <laughs> about what they're seeing. And so they're, everyone is learning a whole lot more about this. So it's very helpful to families who now get to see doctors who have seen other children with this rare disease before, which was much more difficult before. So, um, so they're getting a lot more information and they're providing so much more data for scientists that are working together. And so I think that these, you know, these efforts, um, the initiative you talked about is, you know, excuse me, fantastic. Um, they really do end up helping the individuals living with rare disease as well as the people that are researching them. Absolutely. I mean, the former director of NIH and CAT said that if the whole world can come together to, to find a vaccine for coronavirus mm -hmm. and accelerate drug development for that, we can do this for rare diseases. This is life or death for many rare diseases. Yeah. And yeah. if we collaborate, uh, we can find cures and, and we need to do a better job of that. So there is a lot of hope on the horizon for uh, rare disease cures and treatments. Well, I think that's a good note to end on, uh, the hope on the horizon. Um, that uh, great ending point for us. Um, thanks so much, Debbie, for joining us and letting folks know about so many of the good things happening at NORD. Um, I really encourage folks to attend the NORD Summit. Um, it was life-changing for me in many ways. Um, back when I attended my, you know, my very first one, there's uh, so much more there, lots of great people to be connected with. Um, to help you and your family members. So uh, thanks again, Debbie. I hope to see you in person again soon. Yeah, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me in Nord. All right, take care. Bye.